Hello everybody, good evening, good afternoon, good night, whatever time it might be where you're watching this, um, whatever day it might be where you're watching this. I'm here again to talk about another topic from Calculus BC's second semester, in this case focusing on two more convergence tests that we can use to determine whether particular sums, well, the sums of particular terms of sequences, are going to converge to a finite value or diverge. And in this case, we're going to be focusing on two series that both have the same kind of idea of comparison. We're going to be using some other series we know a little bit more about that might be a little easier to work with to guide our intuition and eventually our actual proof to determine whether or not another series that's a little bit hairier, a little bit crunchier, or more complicated, a little spicier maybe even, whether that series is going to converge or diverge. Before we get there, as I've done the last few days, I like to kick things off by just kind of talking about some of the things that have been going on lately. Um, today brought an uh, interesting um, order, that's Desmos, but basically the new orders from Sacramento County are to not go anywhere, not go out, unless it meets some of these requirements. So some interesting things that you can read online to kind of see what's out there whenever you're seeing this, um, but basically you can only leave for essential needs. Before that order came down, I went to the school to pick up some stuff, drop off a few things, um, and also just to kind of acknowledge the fact that it's looking more and more like that'll be the, you know, basically that the school year may be over in its traditional form, that we may not get to go back to that classroom. And for me, the even though I like it here, obviously, I clearly like my house. Um, I like walking. You should see the floor where I walk the same path and the treadmill that I wear down. But... Um, even though I like it here, I obviously feel a lot of attachment there. So uh, I went in to obviously get stuff, but then also just kind of to say goodbye of sorts to it for the year and to acknowledge the kind of disappointing feeling that is that whatever little adventures and fun things that would have happened, as well as obviously the instruction. I clearly like the instruction a little bit too, but that all that part of the year is probably over. So I hope I'm wrong. I obviously really, really hope I'm wrong. And we'll get to be back there, even if it's for a week. I don't know, you guys might all disagree, but I would love to be there for even just a week to um, wrap things up, be in that space, and to just kind of talk about what will probably end up being a pretty memorable start. Well, pretty memorable end, not necessarily in the best way, but uh, something we won't forget for the rest of our lives for sure. So having said that, huh, let's not make comparisons to hypothetical futures and pasts that might have been. Let's instead start to talk a little bit about calculus. Now, you might notice on this first page that there's absolutely nothing written down. Could be that the reason for that is simply that we're going to have to write down a ton of stuff. But it's actually not. Instead, I like to introduce this topic of series comparison with a fake comic strip I created by one of my favorite artists, probably my favorite comic artist that's still working today. Um, this artist has a special connection to me, basically when Facebook was first opening. I was in the original fan group for his comic strip, and after that, once Facebook kind of changed, it changed a lot for a while, um, somewhere in like the late 2000s, I actually got a friend request from the artist and writer of this comic strip, which does not entitle me to use his characters for any purpose, but I always get a kick out of kicking things off right here and just kind of pointing out and again calling out some of my favorite things as kind of a means of making things cool. So first of all, to introduce us to the concept of the comparison test, I present to you a Pearls Before Swine unofficial comic creation. Can we call this like fan fiction maybe? Maybe that's a good way to look at it. I'm not sure how that works with visuals, but here we go. So Pearls Before Swine. If you haven't read it before, if you haven't read the comic, basically there are a few characters. Um, the main characters being Pig, who's kind of naive but lovable and like does kind of silly things a lot of the time. There's Rat, who's kind of conniving and ambitious and really driven. And then you've got the crocodile neighbors who are kind of goofy and make up their own language and are just kind of always a step behind Rat and even Pig with his good nature. Um, but they're really lovable characters nonetheless. Like truthfully, I have more fun with the crocodiles than anything else. So having, having said all that, here is my creation to lead us into this concept. It opens with Pig talking to Rat. Hey, how did your big test go, Rat? Said Pig. Crocodile neighbor hears and wants in on the conversation. Not bad, actually. I earned, said Rat. But suddenly, he was interrupted by Crocodile neighbor. Ooh, me did's real good. Me got 90 on the test. You guys are dummies, said the Crocodile neighbor. Rat turned to look at the Crocodile number. 
Neighbor shook his head. Like I was saying, I got a 397. Test was out of 400. This confused Crocodile Neighbor for a moment. 90? 397? Oh, creds. Rat did better. Pig, ever the optimist, offers. Should I tell him that in golf, his would have been better? The end. So anyway, very small. But if you're following the comic strip here that I created out of someone else's creation, the key element was that, at first, Crocodile Neighbor was very excited by his 90 on the test. Naturally, 90 sounds like a really good score. But unfortunately, by comparison with either rat score or the total number of points on the test, turned out that 90 wasn't quite as impressive as it might have originally been. The important thing here was context. Having some context and something concrete to compare it to, like the total number of points on the test or even possibly rat score, is enough for someone to be able to get much better information about what's actually happening. And having said that, that's really the gist of comparisons. We're going to use information we know about some other series, some series that fits the rules and convergence tests we already know, something maybe geometric, maybe something a P series, something that's easy to work with that way. And we're going to use that information to draw a conclusion about a new series. So having said that, there are two different tests we're going to look at that fall under this category of series comparison tests. We'll start with the more concrete one. I will say it's a little clunkier. The second one is far less concrete but super easy to work through. And truthfully, it's one of those skills where people that are really comfortable with series often do it in their head to decide converge or diverge. Um, not in formal situations where you have to justify things, but at least for the very beginning. So kicking things off, we're gonna first look at what's called the direct comparison test. So let me make sure I've got this right. I wanna be able to see it. Even though you've probably figured this out already, I actually have no lenses in my glasses because they reflect really poorly. So. Yeah, I'll squint at it for you. So what does the direct comparison test do? Well, first of all, the direct comparison is all about comparing two tests. One that's bigger, one that's smaller. And of course, depending on which one you have and what relationship you're looking for and whether you're trying to determine divergence or convergence, your options will differ. So first of all, it says to let zero be less than a sub n, less than or equal to b sub n. So an important thing to note right off the bat is that both a sub n and b sub n are positive. So that's an important first step, is we're requiring these series be positive in order for us to perform what's called a direct comparison. So a very important first step for us. Also, it's really important to note that a sub n is smaller, just based on the inequality, I'm not talking something else, just a sub n is smaller, b sub n is bigger. And I guess if you're looking for ways to remember that based on the names, B for bigger, A for amoeba, which is really small, or atom, however you want to think about it. So there's where we're at right now. So we've established those two things. These are two things we're going to take with us into the rest of this statement of the direct comparison test. <clears throat> First of all, it says in statement one, because there are two different options here, if B sub n series converges, then A sub n series converges also. So in thinking about this true, like trying to mention this, like a good way to kind of, I feel like, oh, there it is. So I say a good way to look at this would be the following statement. If the big series converges, so if the big series converges, small series converges too. The reason I want to phrase it this way is that, of course, I'm not a big memorizer. I'm not a person who likes to just kind of like purely shove information into your head and tell you to record it like DVR. <laughs> it's a modern analogy. What I want you to do is I want you to remember the relationship here. And I'll show you why this works. It's not necessarily a proof. It's more of a conceptual proof. But the idea here is Big converging means smaller ones converge as well. So now as far as the explanation I can offer, and as I said, this isn't really a proof. It's just kind of a conceptual explanation for what's there. Let's say that we're looking at the series B sub n. Since we're told that B sub n converges, that means that B sub n is going to converge to a sum L, which is a real number. 
That's just what we mean by converges. It's like we're saying that if you added up all infinity terms, and by the way, the hidden part and assumption here is that this is from one to infinity. If you added up all the terms of that infinite series, the sum would be some real number L. So far so good. Next, we look at the statement that we are given. We know that a sub n is less than or equal to b sub n. That was just given to us right up here in the problem. That's just a fact, we're taking it as a given. Having said that though, as soon as we know that a sub n is less than or equal to b sub n, what that means is that every respective term of the series, of each series, or sorry, I'll say it this way, every respective term of a sub n, the smaller series, is smaller than the corresponding term of the bigger series. So what that means is if you add up something that has all smaller terms to, and compare it to something that has all bigger terms, you'll see of course that the series of sum of a sub n is less than or equal to the series sum of b sub n. So far so good. Having said that then, let's take a look at all the information we've compiled at this point. Given all this information, we now know that zero is of course less than or equal to the sum of a sub n. And the reason we know that is of course if all the terms of a sub n are, are greater than zero, then their sum has to be greater than zero also. Nothing really fancy there. But then in addition, we also know that this has to be less than or equal to b sub n. But b sub n, we just saw, is gonna to converge to some finite value L. So what this tells us is that the sum, the sum in total, if you want to, of all the terms of a sub n, all infinity, is gonna be somewhere between zero and some real number. What that means is if a sub n sum is between zero and a real number, that means that we can say the series a sub n converges because that's what it means to converge. Its sum is some finite real number. And we just proved it's not only a finite real number, but a positive one. So therefore we've just verified the fact that, you know, honestly, I called this a non, like, a not true, uh, not a perfect proof, but I think this actually might be the real proof. I could be wrong, but it actually looks pretty legit to me, honestly, as I'm looking at it here. But again, there's your explanation for why it is that it's happening. And then just for the sake of including it, I'll put proof in here as well, just in case. Okay, having said that, the direct comparison test includes a second option. The second option says, if the series a sub n diverges, then the series b sub n diverges also. So translating this into big words here, if the small series diverges, then that means that the big series diverges also. And actually, I think I'm remembering, I think the first one's gonna be a valid proof, this one's gonna be less valid, it's gonna be a little more hand wavy. But anyway, so let's go look at our conceptual proof then here. So first of all, they tell us that the a sub n series diverges. That means for the sake of simplicity, since we've got positive terms, that's like saying that the sum of our series is infinity. Hopefully that makes sense. It's just like if we're not going to converge, that means it must be going to infinity because the things are growing too fast. Having said that, we also know that a sub n is less than or equal to b sub n. And just like before, if their respective terms are smaller or were arranged in a certain way, we can then say that the sum a sub n is less than or equal to the sum of b sub n. So again, nothing's different about that line. In fact, I could have just copied it from up there, but I did not think of that until right now. Joke's on me. From here, next thing, and I wanna make sure I say this correctly. That's right. We do know that the series for sure follow this pattern. Zero is less than or the sum of b sub n, or excuse me, of a sub n. And it's true that a sub n sum is going to be infinity. But then we also have, as given, the fact that b sub n sum is gonna be less than or equal to the sum of a sub n. Right, because that would make sense, because we actually already just stated that. So what we've just shown is that the sum of b sub n is greater than or equal to infinity. And that means the series b sub n diverges. And sorry, I'm writing it down below because I don't know where my face is on all this. And so there we go. So we've just shown that in this case, the smaller one diverging means that it has a sum of infinity. And since the other one's bigger, it has to have a sum bigger than infinity as well which means that it diverges by our definition of diverging. So there is the limit, or excuse me, the direct comparison test. 
we look at the, a series that we know something about that maybe behaves in a similar or very com easily comparable way to the one that we're trying to prove. And then we show that one is either always bigger or smaller, depending on our goal. And then we state that it's a direct comparison. So now there's a lot going on here. Like this is actually a little bit more complex than it might seem when I'm saying bigger than infinity diverges, smaller than a real number converges. So let's actually look at a couple examples and I'll try to work through them very carefully for you. So the first one we're gonna look at asks us to determine whether the series converges or diverges. And our series is the sum from one to infinity of one over n squared plus eight to the n. So we actually have a couple different options that are here. Now, in looking at this particular series, we wanna choose a series to compare it with. And truthfully, that's kind of the art form of the comparison test, is choosing out of every possible series in the world, the one that we're gonna make as our comparison. So in looking at this expression, something that jumps out at me more than anything else, not just because I'm drinking a lot of water, is I see a part that looks a little like a P-series. Like, take a look right there. I see one over N squared. What that does, and this isn't necessarily gonna always work, but it looks like a good strategy and often it is. What I'm thinking is that one over n squared is something that's a really strong structure that's a part of this particular series. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna go ahead and compare it to another series that looks just like that. In particular, I'm gonna compare it to the series from one to infinity of one over n squared, a P series that we know a whole bunch about. So basically from here, what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna look at this series that seems to behave in a similar way to the one we're gonna compare with, and I'll think about whether it converges or diverges. So what I'm noticing here, first and foremost, is that the series from one to infinity of one over n squared definitely converges. And then of course, the reason why it converges is it converges by P series. Now I haven't done any work to support this, so I do need to say of course that P is equal to two which is greater than one. So what that means is that I can use the, or basically I am aiming to use this convergent P-series to show that this crunchier guy, the one with a little bit of extra cayenne pepper on it, that, that spicier one is gonna converge also. Now using the direct comparison test, notice that if we're trying to talk about a convergent series, we're gonna have to use this version right here. We need to look at the situation where the bigger series converges and then make sure the smaller one converges also. So what that means for us is I wanna show that the one on the left is less than or equal to the one on the right. Because if that's true, we'll show that our bigger series converges and then that will prove that the smaller one will converge as well. In fact, I feel like I should've written bigger and smaller, lo siento. Okay, so having said that, we need to now make a valid comparison to show how these two compare. So what we're gonna start with is we're gonna start with what I call a term-by-term -term comparison. What that means is we wanna try to just look at the terms. We'll forget about the series for a second. Remember how on the proof kind of explanation, at least that we went through, I did this blue step where I said, well, if that's true, then the series come out. What that really means is that this part's gonna be free no matter how we do it. Instead, I wanna work on showing the comparison of the individual terms. So what I'm gonna start with is I wanna eventually show that the, this thing is smaller than this thing. Before I can do that though, I need to look at their denominators. So specifically I've got n squared plus eight to the n, and I've got n squared as my denominators. And I'm gonna point out here as well, as we look at those denominators, that in addition to just looking at the denominators, we're only interested in n values greater than or equal to one because that's what the summation says. Sigma notation says we're starting at one and then going up forever, but we're starting at one. So that means n is greater than or equal to one. Now given, actually, I don't think it would've made a difference if, it, if we didn't say that, but given that, looking at these two, which one's bigger, the one on the left or the one on the right? Now, this is gonna feel like you're doing something wrong, but if you said the one on the left is bigger, you're absolutely right. So it is definitely bigger. If you plug in one right off the bat, one plus eight is nine, and that's way bigger than one. So clearly the one on the left is larger. Now at first you might feel despair and go, oh no, it's just not working. How am I gonna get there? We've just, I thought we were trying to show that it was smaller. But the nice thing is, because those guys are smaller, let me make sure I say this correctly, yes, yes, yes. Because those guys are smaller, we can then flip both sides. And although it's maybe not the way you've thought about it before, that actually reverses the inequality. In fact, some would say that just like if you multiply by a negative, it's the same thing if you raise both sides to a negative power. The idea being 
like just so you can kind of see where this is. I'll erase this in a second. One over big equals small. And one over small equals big. Something to do with like direct proportionality or I'm sorry, inverse proportionality or inversely proportional. Like there's a bunch of different ways to describe it. But the important thing is that that reciprocal thing actually reverses the inequality sign. And the cool thing is, now that we've done it and thought about it a little bit, that was exactly the comparison we wanted. So what we've now shown, again, making sure that I'm doing things truly, that's definitely true. So what we can say at this point is because that's true, we can then say that the sum from one to infinity of one over n squared plus eight to the n is less than or equal to the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n squared. And keep in mind, we already established right up here that this one converges. So having said that, having said that it converges, make sure I do this correctly, we actually have everything that we need. So now we've just shown that a larger series converges, and since both of them are positive, that's actually all that we possibly needed. We can then conclude everything by saying this series, and I'll write the whole thing out there, I'm going to be responsible and respectful of that series name. We'll say that that series converges and then here when we cite our stuff, we could call it the direct comparison test, but that's not really strong enough. Instead, what we want to note is the comparison that we made with another series. So I'll say it converges by direct comparison. Sometimes I get lazy and write that as direct comp, but it's not a word. That word comparison isn't so complicated. <laughs> So I don't have to worry about too much by saying it. The important thing is it says converges by direct comparison with, and then we just cite one more time, the series that we held it in comparison to, which was our convergent P series right there. And there it is. Although I guess technically I could have just box converges. I just feel better boxing the entire thing. So there is our explanation. Now, if you're one of those people who wants to know like how, how would someone be assessed on this? Like what would I be looking for? The key thing I'd be looking for here is a valid series to compare with and justification for its convergence. I'd want to see the algebra or the inequality work that you did to get to this point. I'd want to see then you state correctly that it converges and then properly cite the series by name and use the direct comparison test itself by name as well. So those would be the pieces I'd be looking for were I grading your stuff. I'm obviously not, but were I grading your stuff, that's what it would do. Now having said that, just as kind of a quick pause before we go on to our second example so that we've kind of been comprehensive here, I do want to point out that although I immediately was drawn to that P series, that 1 over n squared part of the structure of the series we were trying to determine the convergence for, something that someone might point out, and probably would if we were in class, would be that this might have been an option as well. Well, not just the a to the n, but right there. What if someone instead decided to compare this with a series that looked instead like the sum from one to infinity of one over eight to the n? Now I'll point out to you that that might seem like a bad choice, but actually one over eight to the n is the same thing as one eight to the n, which is a convergent geometric series. So if someone wanted to, they could use the geometric series. They could compare instead this way, compare it to eight to the n, and they'd see that once again the same conclusion would hold. Just like it was previously, we'd actually be able to see that this one converges, but in this case by comparing it directly to a convergent geometric series. Since of course if you're looking up there, the absolute value of r in this problem is 1 8, which is clearly less than 1. So even though I demonstrated with a p series, that's just because I find p series very appealing. <laughs> So having said that, like that you could use something else. Don't feel like the only because I choose to do a problem a particular way doesn't mean that you couldn't do it some other way. There are some situations where you have to do it one way, but this isn't exactly one of those situations. So I'll mention in here really fast that we could also compare. Could also compare. Ooh, I've got my British accent. We could also compare to the convergent geometric series. 1 over 8 to the n.
So just know that that's also a possibility. I'd forgotten to do it so when I moved on to the next problem, so I just erased the work I was doing in the next problem and went back from here. So just know that's also a possibility. Okay, our next move is probably predictable if you think about the way instruction often works. I try to get you as many or as an efficient sampling of problems to kind of demonstrate new techniques and new ideas. So in this case, you're probably expecting that this will be a situation where we check to see or we use direct comparison to show that a particular series diverges. And if that's what you think, then hey, far be it from me to try to argue with you. Um, you'd be right, but that's beside the point here. The point is, I'm just trying to give you as good an example as possible, and I think it's an appropriate time to bring in something different. So having said that, here's what we got. We want to determine whether this series converges or diverges. So in this case, after looking at that last example, it's probably tempting to think, oh, well, I just have to compare it to whatever denominator I want. You might want to start to pick. So before you start to just pick whatever, let me point out that there are two different series that are kind of hiding down here, and we want to choose the best one to go with. And I would argue in this problem that there really is one series that we should choose. So looking at those two, aside from the fact that that square root looks really, looks wicked sweet. Okay, never mind, it doesn't look that cool anymore. For some reason it looks really neat to me, I don't know. So if we're looking at these two series, let's think about what we know. Do we know anything about the sum of one over square root of n? The answer is yeah. Yeah, that's a p-series. And in fact, looking at this p-series, since it's a p-series and the power would be one half, because that's what a square root is, in fact, we'd be able to say this p-series diverges. So that would be a valid possibility. So if we're gonna go in this direction, we'd be looking to talk about divergence. On the other hand, do we know what's happening with one over ln of n? No. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. It's not a p-series. It's definitely not geometric. I mean, what else do we know at this point? Like, we know p-series, we know geometric. The integral test, do you, do you want to try to do, like, you want to anti-differentiate this? Not to mention it doesn't even work at 1 because that wouldn't go very well. Like, do you really want to try that? I don't think you want to. So my thought is, this is actually a situation where although there are two things in the denominator, we really only have one choice. I want to use the p-series. I love p-series. So here we go. We're going to look at the p-series instead. See, this is one of those times where like in-person live instruction is so much better than just looking at a page because I erased all that good thinking and discussion that we just had there. Well, discussion is just me talking to the computer. But you, you get the idea. So from right here, what we want to do is we want to compare this to the series that looks like it's similar. The sum from one to infinity of one over the square root of n. And just for the sake of clarity, since p-series may have been something you learned really recently, that's the same thing as one over n to the one half. So there's what we got. This would be a divergent p-series. If you wanted to wait, I could, I could buy that. This diverges as a p-series And specifically, it's a p-series with p equaling 1 half, which is less than or equal to 1. So basically, we're trying to compare this to a divergent p-series. So keep in mind, as soon as we establish that this one diverges, that forces the direction of the inequality that we need to set up. And by that, I mean it forces how we're going to compare. We need to show that the one we're looking at is larger than this diverging one. If we can't show that, then we can't use direct comparison. That's always a possibility. It could just be a futile effort, like sometimes things are in life. So in this case, we're going to hope that this works out. Now, before we start things off, I'm going to start by making the comparison, just like we did on the previous one. I'm going to look at the denominators, too, since both of them have a really nice numerator. So I'm going to look at the square root of n minus ln of n, and then I'm going to compare that to the square root of n. The question for us is which one of these things is bigger when n is greater than or equal to 1. So now, interestingly enough, when n is equal to 1, we get square root of 1 minus 0 and square root of 1, which means they're completely equivalent. So we just need to, it doesn't help us in any way, but it's something there. Now, after that point, though, if we plug in any larger value, what we'll have is some value that's positive and we'll be subtracting that positive thing. So we're going to minus something positive. So if we subtract something positive, that means this side is smaller than the one on the right side. And that should make sense. I mean, obviously, we're not going to get a rational number after 1. 
But if this had value, let's say, 3, clearly the one on the left is smaller because you're subtracting something positive. As soon as we establish that, we can likewise flip both sides or take the reciprocal of both sides. I think that's the best way to talk about it. Yeah. And then that, of course, flips the inequality as well. So what we've just shown is just by simple comparison, I'd say this is a simple comparison, that the terms of the series we're looking at are larger than the terms of that divergent p-series. Now having said that, as soon as we establish that, that means a natural follow-up is the fact that the sum of those terms on the left side from that larger series means that the series sum is going to be larger than the series sum of that divergent p-series. And since this thing is equal to infinity, or is diverging, or therefore like having its sum tend to infinity, this suggests that our sum is going to in fact diverge as well. So to wrap this thing up, we'll finish off just the same way we did the last one. We'll be able to say that therefore our sum from 1 to infinity, I was going to say n, but 1 to n infinity, of the square root of ln minus ln of n, we're going to say that that one diverges. And of course our reasoning is that we just showed that that series that we're trying to figure some stuff out about is actually always larger than a divergent one that already goes to infinity. If you're bigger than infinity, guess what? You might as well be at infinity too. So in other words, we'll say that this one diverges, and we'll say it diverges by direct comparison. But we don't want to just say by direct comparison, we want to say direct comparison with what? And we would say then with the series n equals 1 to infinity of this 1 over the square root of n. So what we've got, same situation as before. We pick an appropriate series to compare with. We discuss its convergence or divergence. We make a val valid algebraic comparison. We make our decision correctly about diverges in this case. And then we state the test by name as well as including the series that's there as well. So that is direct comparison. Now again, I haven't given you the worst possible examples to use. There are some nutso ones that are kind of uncomfortable ones that are out there, I think is the best way to describe it. There's some ones that just kind of drive you crazy and make you uncomfortable as you're working through it. But these are pretty simple problems. I'm trying to keep it very straightforward so you get that concept in your head. Because I think conceptually this is way more important than just being able to purely execute that technique. Now having said that, before we go on and I give you your try it so you can take a look at these things, I do want to include something that's a little bit different. I don't think we've ever had this before, maybe once or twice um, in the course of calculus at some point. That's a WO. That stands for watch out. This is a situation where lots of people get confused and make mistakes. Um, and it's one of the few misconceptions that's really out there with the direct comparison test that's pretty straightforward. So in this case, what I want to point out is that the direct comparison test doesn't always do everything you want it to. Take for instance this series. So in looking at that series, I think a natural thing to want to compare with would be this guy. Do you remember the name of this series? Harmonic. Yeah, it's the harmonic series, exactly. And this series diverges. You could say because it's the harmonic series. I'll actually do that. You could also say as a p-series with p equals 1. Whatever, how, Whichever way you want to approach it. So we're going to say it's a divergent harmonic series. Fair enough? Yeah, cool. Having said that, now that we've mentioned that, a natural comparison would be to do this. Well, we'll look at those denominators. It's pretty clear that for n greater than or equal to 1, actually I'm pretty sure this is true for all values of n, but for sure for n greater than or equal to 1, clearly the one on the left is larger than the one on the right. Flipping both sides, we end up here. We get that 1 over n plus 1 is less than or equal to 1 over n. So that naturally leads us to that comparison of their sums you feel like you're getting somewhere. And indeed you get here. And you feel like, hey, I've done something, diverges. But wait, all we've shown at this point, because this one diverges, is we've just shown that this series is smaller than a divergent one. This is literally where we stand. Unfortunately, saying that you're smaller than a divergent series just isn't very convincing. Like that just doesn't provide a good enough information, good enough information at all. 
basically, if your series is smaller than a divergent one, that could mean that this can, is infinity. It could be equal to infinity, and in fact, in this case it is. But it's also a possibility that instead, this thing could converge to some real number L. We just don't have enough information. Because L is less than or equal to infinity, so is infinity, both opportunities are still there. What this tells us is that this test is inconclusive. So it is possible that you attempt with good intentions to work through the direct comparison test and you accidentally run into a mess and just come into a situation that just doesn't lead where you thought it was gonna lead. In this case, this is one such situation. It leads us to an inconclusive result that doesn't actually show us that the series diverges or even converges. It tells us nothing, unfortunately. So the direct comparison test is not a world beater of sorts. It's just a good technique for certain structured problems. And again, if you're wondering how it is that we're going to attack this one, we'll talk about that in just a second. For now, I want to give you a little bit of time to work through the triads corresponding to direct comparison. If we're thinking about direct comparison, all you need to do is work your way through um, these two problems on your own. Um, basically, one is not a full direct comparison, like you don't have to actually do the test, it's just asking you whether you can use it, and the other one is asking you to do a full direct comparison. So like many of these things, even though I've attached it to uh, something with a QR code, I've given you something to practice with, I don't necessarily recommend that, that you just go through there and if you get the answer right, you call it a day. Instead, I'd say it's better to actually like look at the written solutions for these things that will be posted eventually if they're not already. So please do take some time to try to perform and practice and perfect the direct comparison test. I'll take a short break and then I'll come right back and I'll work through the next section of the lesson too. Already, hopefully you've had some good time to work through those direct comparison practice problems and you feel pretty solid about it, even though, as I said, it's a little bit more of the cumbersome test. It's a more cumbersome test for sure. So having said that, the next one we're going to talk about is absolutely not cumbersome unless you really don't like evaluating limits at infinity. In my personal opinion, this is the cleanest, the finest of the convergence tests that we're going to get. I believe there are seven or eight, maybe even nine that we'll see in this unit. This is by far my favorite. It's the one that I take advantage of by far the most frequently. It too is a comparison. It's going to look in some ways similar to what we did before, but it's going to be much cleaner, more algebraic, or more calculus based, more analytical. So here it is. It's called the limit comparison test. And at first it, it may look like gibberish. It's a little confusing. It's a little out there. So I'll just break it down part by part, then I'll give you a little bit of some context for all this stuff before we start looking at it. So the limit comparison test says, first of all, assume that a sub n and b sub n are positive sequences. Or more likely, since they're gonna be parts of a series, that the terms a sub n and b sub n are all positive. So it's important to establish that they're positive because you'll see that it requires, the result depends on it being finite and positive. So having said that, we next talk about the fact that the limit of the ratio of a sub n to b sub n is equal to L, where L is a finite positive number. So the idea is, if we take those two sequences, and technically they're sequences for now, they're the terms of series, but they're sequences at the moment because there's no sum just yet, and we evaluate the limit of their ratio, and that limit of the ratio is equal to some finite positive number, L, could be any finite positive number, but note that that means it can't be zero infinity or something negative, then either both series a sub n and b sub n converge or both series diverge. So the idea is if you know the behavior of one of those two series and you can get the limit of their ratios equal to a positive finite number, then you know that the other one's going to behave in the exact same way. If one diverges, the other diverges. If one converges, the other one converges. So having said that, like this can be a little bit tricky because sometimes you're used to getting a result and then checking a result to decide whether it converges or diverges. Here, it's all about what the original one did and then what your result and then getting a result that confirms the original one behavior matches the new one. So it can feel a little bit weird. The word that I use to describe this one, I'll write this down here. The word that I use is series similarity. This is always how I've thought about it. I can't remember if that was something that Mr. Pikarski described at one point or my brother did from Mr. Sanchez or someone else or if I learned it myself from Mr. Friedrich but that idea of series similarity is what's here we find a series that behaves just like this one we kinda take a more complicated series and we boil it down to its parts 
And then we look and see, okay, well, what happens with these parts? That's really what the limit comparison test is doing. It's giving you a tool that lets you boil it down and compare it to something really clean and easy to work with. And as long as you've chosen a valid one, you end up figuring out whether or not the series behaves the same way or not. So having said that, the key element with so many of these series that we haven't really talked about just yet, and you know, really I focus on instructing you about each one, um, but a worthwhile question is to ask, well, when? When am I going to use limit comparison? And the truth is, when to use each test is probably something I'll talk about at the very end of the unit. But for now, the question of when would you use limit comparison is usually pretty easy. I usually talk about any rational series. That's usually where I'm pulling out the limit comparison test. So it's a ratio of polynomials is, <coughs> excuse me, the ratio of polynomials is typically my first go-to. In addition to, oh, by the way, I should say in here as I did in my notes, it's a non-P series though. So we're not talking about P series. If it's a P series, just use P series. But any rational series would work really nicely with it. And then also any ratio of exponentials and that's different than a rational. Rational is specifically polynomials, but any ratio of exponentials would often make this a good choice as well. And again, you'll run into situations where you want to use the limit comparison test, assuming I convey my enthusiasm and love of the limit comparison test to you. Like you may want to use it, it might not work every single time, but trust me, this is a series test that works really nicely. And although I'm going to ask you to show your work with so many of these things, on an AP exam, say, there may be a multiple choice question that asks you which of these series converge. And if you can use something like the limit comparison test without doing any work to speed up your work, you've now saved time to invest towards a more difficult problem later on. So there's a lot of value to being able to at least do some of the stuff in your head, even though, of course, I want you to be able to do the work formally to verify convergence or divergence for a particular series. Now, I wouldn't be me if I didn't at least talk a little bit about the proof. And I will say the limit comparison test proof, which scared me when I printed these notes out yesterday and I started to think about things. But having said that, the thing about the limit comparison test proof is it's really just the direct comparison test and it's super clever. So if you don't like this, I don't know, skip ahead like two minutes. But the truth is now that I've looked at it here with fresh eyes, fresh eyes that don't have to rush to be anywhere, um, I realize just how clever this really is. So starting things off, it starts with the same necessary conditions about a sub n and b sub n being positive, and then it takes that statement about the limit of their ratio being some positive finite real number we're calling L. So because that ratio has a limit equal to a positive finite number, that means that the ratio converges. Like we haven't necessarily thought about that before, but the sequence that is the ratio a sub n over b sub n has to converge because that's just how we defined it. We said if the limit as n goes to infinity is equal to a finite number, then we say it converges. Having said that, as soon as we know the series a sub n over b sub n converges, we know it's bounded and monotonic as well. Those are properties that was almost definitional. Although we used it the other way, we used proving boundedness and monotonicity to prove that a series converged or a sequence converged. In this case, we're going backwards. We're saying that if that happens, the sequence converges for, or is for sure bounded and monotonic. Now having said that, because of the fact that the sequence a sub n over b sub n is bounded, there's going to exist some numbers that are smaller and bigger than the other one. And again, they'll both be positive numbers because we know that the series has to be positive, or at least the sequence has to be positive because we said so. They're always positive themselves. They can't possibly go to zero in that case. And having said that, as soon as we establish this condition, imagine just multiplying b sub n on both sides, well, on all three parts. And when you do that, you get an inequality, the inequality that you see right here. So what we've just shown is that little d times b sub n is less than a sub n and a sub n is less than capital D times b sub n. So there's where we stand. We have an inequality that's come out. Little d and big D are just numbers that form like the lower and upper bounds respectively for the ratio a sub n over b sub n. Now in looking at that ratio for a second, and I'm actually gonna highlight in pink so it draws a little more attention to it, because I think this is really the spot in the proof. So having said that, if the series b sub n diverges, so this is one possibility, if b sub n diverges, then obviously d times b sub n is gonna to diverge too. Technically it's using a property of series, one of those properties we talked about a couple um, topics back, but basically if you multiply something times a divergent series, that's like multiplying infinity times that number d. So it obviously diverges as well. And then because we just said that a sub n is gonna be larger than d times b sub n, 
we then have that their respective series also hold that way, and that means that a sub n is larger than a divergent series, which by direct comparison says that it's going to diverge. So what that means is according to this information, given all that we have, if b sub n diverges, then a sub n diverges by direct comparison. So we've just shown that in the divergence case, both of them behave the same way. On the other hand, if b sub n converges, then obviously capital D times B sub N is gonna converge as well. Once again, it's just a property of these series. Whatever L was before, multiply it times capital D. Keep it on the DL down low because DL. <laughs> yeah, whatever, you're not watching the proof anyway. So beside the point, I was excited by that, but that's okay. So we know that that bigger one is gonna converge as well. But then we know that a sub n is smaller than capital D times b sub n, which means their respective series behave and or hold the same inequality. And that means that then a sub n is smaller than a bigger convergent series. So a sub n series has to converge as well. So once again, direct comparison makes everything work out nicely. So what we've shown is that if b diverges, then a diverges. And if b converges, then a converges. So basically the limit comparison tests claim that if you know how one behaves, the other will too, assuming all of those requirements that we have, that the ratio or the both series are positive, the ratio is has a limit um, that is a positive finite number, then we're gonna get that result that we're looking for, that the two series behave the same way. So again, people don't usually love the proof. I just, I really like that proof. I admire and appreciate that proof quite a bit. But I'm guessing you're probably more the kind of person who wants to see this in action. Let's actually do precisely that. So we're going to look at a couple examples here. And I think I just have two, so this will probably move pretty fast. And I'm hoping that I contain my enthusiasm long enough to... Ah! Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Just so excited to use the limit comparison test. Such a favorite of mine. So we're going to, just like before, determine whether the series converges or diverges. And in this case, we're giving you something that at first might look okay. You see n squared, you're like, ah, oh, this is easy. And then you see the denominator, and you're like, what the heck? Why are we looking at this mess? Yeah, I get it. So basically here, we've got some complicated crunchy function, or crunchy series, really. But we want to start to attack it. Now, the problem with this, the problem with attacking the series is we've got to make sure that we choose the right series to compare it with needs to be one that we know without any hesitation is going to converge or diverge, so we know the behavior of well. And it has to be one that behaves in a similar way to the one that's over there. In fact, I have to say, I think that's the best way to put it, it needs to grow at the same rate or according to the same magnitude as the one on the left. So this can throw people a little bit, but since you pro had, you probably, you may have had me as a teacher or you had Ms. Formaker, we've talked about controlling term analysis, we've talked about the idea that certain terms in a numerator and denominator respectively control the growth like they basically are so powerful that the other ones basically don't matter at all the reason i bring that up is i'd point out that in looking at this expression n squared over 3n to the fifth minus 2n plus 1 i'd ask you to point out that that should be very similar i'm using approximately but as n goes to infinity that should be approximately equal to n squared over n to the fifth because n to the fifth is a large is the largest degree term so these other two basically are dwarfed by the growth of n to the fifth power and obviously n to the second over n to the fifth simplifies to one over n to the third so here's my thinking if we want to make a comparison we should compare it to the series that has terms of the form one over n to the third because one that's a p-series I know all about p-series and two the other one is just the same thing it's just been dulled up and like had some extra stuff thrown in there. So we want to compare it to something that's very similar, that grows with the same magnitude. I submit that this is our guy. So having said that, let's see if this actually works. So from here, let's make a move. I'll use the hunter green here. So from here, I want to talk about one over n to the third because I submit that that's going to be the perfect comparison. Well, first of all, the series from one to infinity of one over n to the third is clearly a p-series. And looking at that p-series, we have a power p of 3. 3 is larger than 1, so this is going to be a convergent p-series. So I'm going to say right here, and I need to state this, this isn't me just being overly communicative, it needs to be there. This series of 1 over n to the third converges, and then I could say by p-series. And specifically, although I'd love to say p-series test, I'll just say p-series with p equaling 3 
which is greater than 1. So we have a convergent p-series. So now having said that, if limit comparison works, we're going to try to check the ratio, and then if we get a positive finite number, that means that the crunchy series has to converge as well, because the behaviors match. Limit comparison is all about whatever the simple one does, the complicated one does too, assuming everything matches in the limit comparison. So we're aiming for convergence here. So I'm going to underline it in red, something that contrasts with the green, so that way we have to see it at the very end. Now having done it, we're going to set up the ratio. So I'm going to set up the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of first n squared over 3n to the fifth minus 2n plus 1. And then the denominator, I'll put that series we're comparing it with, 1 over n to the third. Now having said that, like this is my submission, is that this should simplify into a finite positive number. Because if it does, that means that the two series behave the same way, and by limit comparison, the new one will converge as well. So let's start to tackle this thing. This isn't a trivial algebraic problem, so we do have to do a little bit of work. So first of all, we're dividing by a fraction. So if I use one of my favorite techniques, something that's taught to me by Carmen Yu, if we do that, we'll multiply by n cubed over 1. So this is kind of a nice visualization. Notice that that goes to 1 in the denominator. If we do that, then that's going to give us instead the limit of n squared times n cubed in the numerator, which is n to the fifth over, sorry, that just looks not so good to me, over 3n to the fifth minus 2n plus 1. So this is now the series that we need to actually evaluate. Having said that, now that we're here, many of you could immediately and instantly just say that this is equal to 1 third. And if you can, I love that. I'm a huge fan of that very thing. Having said that though, just for the sake of completion, let me one time demonstrate exactly why that controlling term analysis that you could quickly jump through works and just kind of remind you, because I haven't been real good about reminding you all the time. The reason that works is that you can multiply up and down by the same factor without changing the value. So I'm gonna multiply up and down by one over n to the fifth. I've chosen one over n to the fifth because what I'm trying to do is quote unquote nerfing the growth n to the fifth. I want to make it so that that growth is all leveled out. I want to level the playing field almost, if you will. And I call it nerfing because like nerf is like if you have a football and you throw it, it breaks a window. If you throw a nerf football, it's softer so it doesn't break the window. Theoretically, I'm not making any claims about the possibility of breaking a window with a nerf football. I said nothing. I did. There's record of it, but you get what I'm saying. So from here, if we evaluate this limit, again, I realize the answer is one third. I'm just asking you to remember and respect where it comes from. Our numerator becomes 1. Our denominator, if we distribute this 1 over n to the fifth in, we get 3n to the fifth over n to the fifth, which is 3, minus 2n over n to the fifth, which is 2 over n to the fourth, and then plus 1 over n to the fifth. Now, if you evaluate this at infinity, you still have 1 in the numerator, you still have 3 down there, and then this will be 3 minus 2 over infinity plus 1 over infinity. And that's the same thing as one third. <coughs> and one third is positive and finite. Obviously, make sure that your number is indeed positive and finite, but I feel like this is pretty easy to tell. One third is positive because it's not negative or zero, and finite because it's not infinity. So, positive and finite answer. So, that means that we've done everything that we need to. We can finally draw our conclusion and bring it all together. We can therefore say, that the series in question, which again I'll be respectful and write it out for you, therefore our series, the sum of n squared over 3n to the fifth minus 2n plus 1, we'll say that this series behaves the same way as the one we compared it with. So since the original converged, we'll point out that this one also converges, so that that way they match, that's what the limit comparison test says. It converges, and we'll say it converges by limit comparison And just as before with direct comparison, if we're going to make a limit comparison, we need to cite directly in our final statement what compare, what situation or what series we compared it with. So it converges by limit comparison with the P series that we had before, 1 over n to the third. There is our work. There is limit comparison at its finest.
So what you've seen here is a good depiction of what's there. Obviously, I did a little extra work right here. I realize you can move a lot faster than that. But for the moment, what I did first was I looked at the structure of the sum end, in other words, the terms of this series, and I tried to boil it down a little bit into a simpler series that grew at the same rate, so that we had two comparable series. In this case, growing at the same rate was 1 over n to the third, a convergent p series, which I paid lip service to proving was a convergent series, really basically over on the right side. Once I had it, I set oops. Once I had it, I set up my limit. I evaluated it algebraically or transformed it algebraically into a simpler version, a simpler ratio, or the limit of a simpler ratio. And then I went through and I was carefully showing why the controlling term analysis gave us the answer of one third. Once I got to the final answer of one third though, I saw and observed that one third was positive and finite, which means that the limit comparison test says that both the original series that we were trying to analyze and that simpler one, which for us was the P series one over N cubed, both of them are gonna behave the same way. So since the P series converged, so did the crunchier, spicier version that we were tasked with evaluating and checking. Not evaluating, just checking. So there it is. Looks like this series should indeed converge. So we've done one, let's look at a second one. And as I've said before, I always try to be comprehensive in my examples so that that way you feel like you've gotten a little bit of everything. So here is our second example we're gonna look at. I believe this is the last one though, besides the triad, obviously. So once again, we're going to try to determine whether this series converges or diverges. And we're going to have to look at this slightly more complicated series, the sum from 1 to infinity of 5 to the n plus 3 over 2 to the n plus 17. So once again, I'm going to begin by thinking about controlling term analysis. I'm going to try to think about a series that behaves kind of the same way, kind of getting rid of some of the riffraff, the frou-frou that's just kind of laying around there. So my thought is this as I look at this series. I'm a huge fan of threes and seventeens, like don't get me wrong, but the truth is if they weren't there, we'd have two exponential things that grow really fast themselves. They're very powerful, strong, resonant growers. So in other words, what that means is that this is basically the same thing as, oops, five to the n over two to the n, or at least they grow the same way. And then truthfully, five to the n over two to the n is five over two to the n, just in a different form. The reason this is so important is that this is a familiar type of sequence. Specifically, it's a geometric sequence. It says we're gonna multiply by five over two over and over and over again. Because of that, this geometric sequence has a ratio, a common ratio of five halves. And that value is positive, which suggests that we have a divergent series. So my thought is we're gonna to try to compare it to a divergent series, five over two to the n. So let's set up the comparison itself. First of all, let's analyze this series that we want to look at. So far, we've just mentioned 5 over 2 to the n. We'll formalize it and point out that this is really us trying to analyze the behavior of 5 over 2 to the n. Our theory is that's going to be the perfect limit comparison for us, or the perfect series to compare with. So having mentioned that, 5 over 2 to the n, we know that this is going to diverge. So I'll say that it diverges by geometric series. And I could say geometric series test as well. I'll, I'll be comprehensive here. Geometric series test. And specifically, I'll point out that the absolute value of r equals 5 halves, which is greater than 1. So we have a divergent geometric series. So different. First time we haven't dealt with a p-series here specifically. So having said that, let's next set up the limit. So we're going to do the limit as n goes to infinity of our numerator, 5 to the n plus 3, divided by 2 to the n plus 17. And then I'm going to pull this up a little bit, give myself a little more space. I'm an aesthetics person, I can't lie. All this is over 5 to the n over 2 to the n. And again, if you're wondering why I didn't put it in exactly this form, it's because I can kind of see where things are going. It'll be easier to have them separate. You'll see why in a second. So having done that, I'm going to pull that same trick that I've mentioned before, the one that Carmen kind of pointed out to me a little while ago, or last year. So having said that, we'll take the limit as n goes to infinity. In this case, if I distribute everything through, obviously in the denominator we get one. In our numerator, we're going to have a two to the n distributing in, that'll give us five to the n times two to the n, or 10 to the n, plus three times two to the n. And in the denominator, 
we're going to get another 10 to the n from the 2 to the n and 5 to the n product plus 17 times 5 to the n. So there is the limit that we have to evaluate to determine whether or not this is actually a valid limit comparison. So in looking at this thing, this can throw people a few times, like especially those first few times you look at it. You might stare at it and go, wait, what? What am I supposed to do from here? Like 10 to the n, 2 to the n, they're both exponential. The truth is, if you are a controlling term analysis person, you might be able to instantly see that that's equal to 1. If you're not that person, let me point out that a good strategy for that very thing would be to multiply both sides by 1 over 10 to the n. The reason being, 10 to the n does seem like it should be growing larger than 2 to the n, so let's just see what happens when we do so. If I distribute that in, these are my greatest like little rainbow things here, but let's see what happens. Take the limit as n goes to infinity. 10 to the n over 10, or times 1 over 10 to the n is just 1. On the next one, we'll have plus 3 times 2 to the n over 10 to the n. That's going to simplify to 3 over 5 to the n. In the denominator, we'll also have 1, but then here we'll have 17 over 2 to the n, because the 5 to the n over 10 to the n will simplify to 2 to the n. Having done so, as you might expect, we'll get 1 plus 3 over infinity over 1 plus 17 over infinity. Both the over infinities go to 0, which leaves us 1. And 1 is as finite and positive as they come. Am I sure? Oh, heck yes. I'm positive. <laughs> So we've just shown that the limit of the ratios gives us a finite positive number. And what that means is both series are going to behave the same way. So although in the previous problem we used limit comparison test and found that this series we were looking at converged, that was because the thing we compared it to converged. In this case, the series we're comparing it to diverges. And since limit comparison is all about telling us that the two series behave the same way, our final conclusion is going to be that our crunchier series, the spicy one that we were looking at for the first time, that series diverges, and I think I used red last time, we'll do the same thing, that series diverges, because again, it's got to match the behavior of the original. So this one diverges by limit comparison, and just like before, I want to cite the series that I made the limit comparison with, by limit comparison, with, and then I'll include that series, which was that divergent geometric series, 5 over 2 to the n. And there is our answer. And as well as our work, really, this was all this work was us just leading to the answer. And we saw that once again, whether converging or diverging, I'd say that the limit comparison test works really nicely. You can see that there is a little bit of artistry that happens here. Right here, we do have to make some tough choices to choose which series to compare it to. And then we do have to use some of our existing series convergence knowledge to make a valid proof that that series we're comparing it to converges or diverges. Don't neglect that part because it's usually the easiest bit. And then, yeah, there's a little bit of algebra. But again, the algebra is not too crazy, not too wild. It's the same kind of algebra all the time. You're multiplying by the reciprocal down below, and you're ending up checking if a number like 1 is finite or positive. In this case, we did. We got there, and we're confident that this series will diverge, in fact. Having said that, that leaves us at the end of this lecture. We've got the second triad for you, or I've got the second triad here for you. So it's got a couple questions. Two, the first two are kind of your standard use limit comparison test to work your way through. I'd say with both of these, as soon as you feel decently comfortable with the limit comparison test, I'd say you should always just look at the series beforehand and make your determination or decide pretty quickly whether you expect it to converge or diverge. I'll give you extra practice with that later on, or I'll try to develop or find a way to post some tools that have extra practice with that very thing. Um, but having said that, like that's just kind of the a good thing, a good strategy to get used to. It's kind of your number sense or calc sense kind of stuff that you're doing with series. Having said that, those first two are traditional problems to kind of work through the proof for. The last one is a little more problem solving, and it turned out to be a little more interesting than I expected. I thought I was like all clever writing it. It turned out to just be kind of a, it wasn't as cool an answer as I thought, but you might find it interesting to think about. There's some cool cases that you might play with. Um, but in any event, um, hopefully this has been another good um, lecture that's covered some good material for you and helped you 
What's the word I'm looking for? Helped you get your mind around, wrap your mind around, there's what I was going for. Help you wrap your mind around both the direct and limit comparison tests as potential tools to demonstrate that a series converges or diverges depending on the situation. As always, I've enjoyed bringing this to you and presenting this and producing this for you um, using my own equipment and my own stuff and my own time. So thank you for watching. Again, hopefully you're learning some stuff. Hopefully everything's fine where you are. You're staying well, staying inside, washing those hands and keeping your social distance at a minimum of six feet. And until I get a chance to see you again, have a great day. I miss you. And thanks again for watching.